today? Glory seekers. Are you a glory seeker this morning? I hope that you are. And at, at least by the end of the message that you will want to be one. Hallelujah. The last time I spoke, this already quite a few weeks ago, because Pastor Jennifer has been the, the speaker for the last few weeks, I spoke about uh, the main text was pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And we have been exploring holiness and personal holiness or personal sanctification. So today, with this topic, we want to continue to connect holiness and our, our pursuing of personal holiness with the pursuing the glory of God. So we, we are seekers of to see God's glory. Amen. Hallelujah. So when you hear the word uh, glory, what comes to your mind? What sorts of concept do you, do you have? For different people, different uh, uh, contexts, it may mean different things. How does uh, holiness uh, apply to our lives? What does it mean? Have you experienced God's glory? How can you live to uh, glorify God in your life, at work, in your families? So we want to talk about the glory of God and the holiness of God this morning and make a difference between the two. We explained in our last message about perfect holiness. We, we made distinctions about the different um, ideas that comes with the expression holiness in the Bible. And we said the last time that perfect holiness, it is the highest attribute of God. Holiness is who God is. Holiness is God's perfect attributes. It, what, it is what makes God distinct and separate. His holiness is what He is as God that nobody else can be like. So we want to go to slide number two and start going into this topic of what it means, the definitions of, of glory and how it applies to our lives. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, we know the context of that. Prophet Isaiah uh, was in the presence of God. And the seraphim, the angels, the super angels of God, were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with your glory. Who were the seraphim that we are talking about? They were a glorious form of angels. We know by reading the scriptures that there are different titles, the cherubim, the seraphims. Uh, we have Gabriels, we have messengers, we have uh, different ones. And the seraphim here, it comes from, their name comes from the word burn. And we are not sure if it refers to their appearance, that they would come in like a fiery or some sorts of things or if it describes more the, the purity, the level of purity of God as his ministers. But when Isaiah's eyes open, he saw the Lord and his majestic splendor. Then the descriptions that we read in Isaiah chapter 6 is awesome. Like uh, the, the, the descriptions of God, the gold, the fire, the, the, the tremendous light that, that uh, was shining then. And um, the seraphim cried out for three times, holy, 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 to stress the, about God's holiness. And do you know how it is significant that at this time Isaiah saw the glory of God? In the time that Isaiah began his ministry, that this is obviously before he was called into the ministry and commissioned by God, the time in which he lived was uh, extremely immoral, it was moral decay, spiritual decay at its worst. It was a very, very bad time. Idolatry, corruptions, uh, the, the kings would kill, in the, no, no justice in the land, and God was uh, already uh, uh, prophesying judgment was coming to an ungodly society. So it was very important in a time such as this and moral decay generation to see a God, the image of God, high and lifted up. Because everything you see, and it it's resembles so much our, our generation and what we see, what we see on TV, what we see on the net, what we see in the news all around us. Corruptions, greed, violence, divorce, and uh, whatever sorts of immorality that we have. So when, when everything in the world is collapsing, 
when everything is falling apart. You and I as Christians, we need to have uh, something more solid than what we see. We are in the world, but we are not from the world. We are not out of the world. We belong to God. So it is important that if we want to, have, to be efficient, if we want to, to have a, a godly role and a godly influence in this generation, you need more than seeing what everybody sees. We're not to, to live like that. We're not to imitate like this. We're not to follow and just, uh, just go like this. We need a biblical view of a God that is high and exalted above all of these moral corruptions. Please let me hear amen this morning to that, if you believe that. That the holiness means morally perfect, pure, totally apart from sin. So we have discussed that in the past. But what I want to insist upon this morning is when we say about holiness, we want to talk about is infinite perfection. He is just so awesome. He is so different. His distinctiveness, his greatness, his word are such. He is in a class of himself. Nobody can imitate that or be just like him and that kind. He is separate and distinct. This is what holiness means. God is one of his own class. And we, you and I, need to discover a sight of this holiness uh, in our lives. You know, our daily frustrations, the pressures of our societies, the disappointment in our lives, our own shortcomings, affects our view of God. And so many times we, our God just become like part of the big pictures that the, in, in, which, in which we live. We narrow the, 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 we narrow the image of God in our mind. In our generations, we have many people who make their own concept of God. Their own ideas of God becomes God uh, to them. Think about the apostles and the storm and the boat. These are very popular stories that we all know. Jesus is sleeping in the boat. There is the storms, the waves are coming in and they are just about to drown. What are they thinking? What are they shouting? We are drowning! That's, that's the world. That, that is their situation. That is their out of their resources. They, they cannot change that. They cannot do anything. After they see a manifestation of God's glory, what happens? What are they shouting? What, what kind of man is he? You know? He can, even the waves and the, the, uh, and the wind obey him. At first, it's just like, I'm drowning. I can't do anything. After it's like, you focus on God. God has become big to them. And these apostles have been walking with Jesus. And they have seen his glory manifested. You know, even in the first miracle, the first mention of the first miracle in, the, in Cana, the, the, that section that describe this whole event at the wedding of Cana says that they have seen his glory. This is the first time that they have seen the glory. Why do they call it his glory? They saw the nature of God. They saw an aspect of God that they didn't know before. They saw his greatness. They saw his power. They saw his ability. He changed water into, wind, uh, into wine. <laughs> he can do that too. <laughs> He can walk on the water. He can do all of these amazing things. He can speak to the oceans and the waves, and then they will calm down. So who is this man? Who is this God that you have in, in your life? So that's what we're talking about. You and I, we need a glimpse of the glory of God. We need to rediscover what kind of God high and lifted up that we have to empower us to deal with all the issues that we are facing in our lives, and our work, all the disappointment, the daily pressures and everything. Amen. Hallelujah. Seeing God in His splendor will... Uh, produce in us a desire for purity. It will lead us to repentance. It will free our mind and it will create uh, something in us. It will enable us. It will empower us. That's what happened to Isaiah when he saw the, the glory of God. First thing, he went to repentance. First thing, he went to repentance. And then God forgave him and he was called into the ministry. That is what we were talking about last time. You know, many times when you hear the word holiness and modern church living and certification, you immediately think negative concept. 
Don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't sin, don't sin. It's about sin and all this. It's part of it, but it's so much more. The, the holiness of God, uh, we said it very clearly last time, it's the most positive image that we can give. It's the most positive and powerful uh, concept that we, that we can grasp. So personal sanctification is you and me mirror imperfectly the character of God. We want to do it. We, we are growing into that. We are being transformed into doing that. That's what Andrew Murray calls uh, personal sanctification, holy making. We are being made uh, holy as we walk with God, as we discover who He is, as we see Him in action in our life. And the more a disciple you will be, the more you will obey Him, the more you will seek after Him, the more of His glory will be revealed to you. So in summary, if we want to make a distinction between His holiness and the, the holiness of God and the glory of God, we could say that His holiness is more who He is. His divine, eternal nature, His perfection. That is who He is. But the glory of God is, is who He is being seen by His mighty deeds, like uh, calming the oceans, by forgiving sins of the paralytic man by feeding the crowd, by the mighty deeds that he's done. And he was telling people in his time, if you don't believe because of my word, at least believe me because of what I do, because I'm doing what the Father is giving me to do. Believe by the mighty deeds, I, I'm displaying something of the character of God. So believe me in that sense. And we, we see it like even in the beauty of nature and creation. If you go to slide number three, Psalm 19, 1. The heaven declare the glory of God. The sky displays His handiwork. This means God is shouting at us. God is shouting to human beings. Don't you see? Cannot you understand who I am? What I can do? Look around you at all the beauty that I have made for your enjoyment. Cannot you see that? On Wednesday night in our Bible study, we are studying Genesis. And we are rediscovering many, many details about the, the stories that we have read so many times. God created man and women and his likeness and in his image. What does that mean? What he is, we are talking about his beauty, his perfection, his holiness, his power and all of this. He created you and me with his picture, his image, his likeness, to be like that. First of all, to enjoy, to see that, to, to enjoy, to appreciate his holiness. He was coming in the garden every day to have fellowship and his beauty with us. There was no sin, there was no separation, but also to, to display and to relate to him and to live in his glory. And sin disfigured this image of God and his creation. If we click on Romans 1 21, you will, you will see, for although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile and their thoughts and their senseless hearts were darkened and exchanged the glory of immortal God for an image resembling mortal human beings. God existed. God has shown in the beauty of nature that he existed. They have seen it. They could have recognized God, but instead they chose not to glorify him. And they finally were darkened in their mind, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God into idolatry. They, they turned into other things than God. And that's very, very sad. You know, when God, when we read in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, what we read before, the earth is filled with his glory. You know, this morning, even here, right now, if your eyes were open, if our eyes were open, what would we see? We would see the glory of God here. You know, we read and we know and we quote it so many times. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. Where is the glory of God now? The glory of God is here. We are singing songs. What are we doing? We are declaring the glory of God. But do we connect with that? Are we really aware that God is here? Are we praying? Are we seeking? Are we searching? Are we finding the glory of God? When as the church, the body of Christ, we come and worship. That, that should be the reality. That should be uh, the, the, how the people of God would meet with this. You and I, we need eyes. We need new eyes, better eyes. 
better glasses, go to the optometrist, uh, and then get, get spiritual eyes so that we will see God high and lifted up. We, that's, that's the God you, you need to see in, in your life. Go to the next slide, uh, slide four. The context of that is that we read that before we believe in Christ, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable, unable, to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. So there's something missing about the glory. We cannot see the glory of God. We are cut off from the, from the glory of God. But then this verse here changed everything. The God who said, out of darkness the light shall shine, is the same God who made this light shine in our hearts to bring us to the knowledge of God's glory shining in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. There is much to see about this, this text here. But the first thing that you and I need to realize, we are not blind anymore to the glory of God. It says it clearly here. The same God who made this light shine he made in the past his light shine. When you found Christ, something happened. You found some of the glory of Christ, the glorious side of the power of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Before it didn't make sense. It, it was something that was unknown. You could not comprehend these kind of things. But when the veil was lifted, the light of God allowed you to see a revelation of glory, the glory of Christ, the glory of salvation, the glory of his work for us. But there is also a problem with this uh, picture here. The problem is that we have this treasure and jars of clay. And that is how we understand, again, the importance of sanctification. Sanctification is about the jars of clay. God is holy. We are meant to be holy like he is. But we have that in jars of clay. It's covered. It's hidden. And some of us who pray more or connect more with God, who have a higher view of, of his holiness, will maybe display more. Of, of his holiness let more the light of God be seen to people around you uh, so but some of us maybe not so not so much it's it's hidden an earthen vessel this and our imperfections so that's a problem that we have man was created to glory men and women because true man even fallen men, and that's something we have been uh, talking about on Wednesday night even f in his fallen state Men still carry a lot of the image of God. Not maybe the, the purity so much, but there's a lot of potential that God created. When God made man and woman to his image and likeness, we have the potential to love still. We see acts of love. We see uh, arts, music and, and arts uh, being a, a, a side of God and, and the image of, of Men carry this side of God. The, the potential for inventing medical advance, uh, scientific advance to cure a lot of disease. This is the, the, where does it come from? Why do we have these, these things? God created men and women with all of these. But we are vessels which contain his glory. But because of sin, it is very, very hidden. And there's something missing. But when Christ comes, it's more. Uh, slide number five, Isaiah chapter 43. This context is when Isaiah is prophesying that Israel will be called back from the north to return to their land. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. Again, that comes again. I have made them for my glory. Israel was meant to be for my glory. But also they have fallen in their mission. We have fallen in our missions. That's why we need sanctification. But we have been made for the glory of God. We have to understand that. I was made for this. Can you say that with me this morning? I was made for this. I was made for the glory of God. To live in the glory of God. I was made to display the glory of God. That's why I exist. Section number two, seeking, seeking to see God's glory. Slide number six. 
Moses asked God in Exodus 33, verse 18, Now show me your glory. This is an amazing request, don't you think so? Show me your glory. Uh, maybe most of us in this room have prayed that prayer at some point, sometime in the past. Have you? How many of you? Be brave this morning. Show me your hand if you have prayed that prayer before. Yes? I'm surprised not many more hands have been uh, raising the, the, the head. I would think everybody at some point in your path have said, Lord, let me see your glory. Let me see more of you. Let me see who you are really. And, um, you know, many we, desir we desire to, to peek into God's glory. We want to know more about who he is, how he is. But not everybody is allowed to have a glimpse of his glory given to him. And we see that in many texts of the Bible. It is impossible to freely approach God whenever you want to. You, know, you need to have a preparation. Yeah, we read the last time that in Joshua's time, Joshua was commanded, tell the people to sanctify themselves because tomorrow I'm going to do great things before them. First, sanctify yourself. We have many, many texts like this. And if you would click on this text, it's Psalm 24, verse 3 to 5. Who is allowed to ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may go up to his holy dwelling place? And then you have a bunch of uh, requirements over that. Be blameless, have pure motives, do not lie. If you make promise, keep your promise. Uh, and then such people will be rewarded. You want to see more of God? Prepare your hearts and God will reward you with, you, with your prayer. We, we, we read in the, in the New Testament, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So there is a preparation. There is some sorts of conditions. And thank God that we have Jesus Christ that opens the way that we can see God and that we can go to God and, and all of this. But there is definitely a, a requirement uh, to, be, to be holy or to walk in holiness. Maybe sometimes we compare our sinfulness to God's holiness and we feel that we, we, need, you know, we need a little bit of, a, of his uh, uh, holiness to feel, not feel so, so guilty, but we should walk by faith. I remember a few years ago, I was leading a team from the U.S. and China. We were on the boat in the Yangtze River and uh, we were delivering literature to Christians. But then w after we finished, we took this boat and... Uh, on that journey, the boat would stop along the way because yeah, it was picking up uh, farmers or dropping up uh, farmers to go back to their uh, hometown and peasants. And then every time the boat would stop, we would go down, we would quickly, because we had a limited time, give some, uh, some tracks announcing the gospel, speaking to as many people as we could and get back on the boat and then continue to the next place. And there was um, uh, the secretary of a church uh, of that team uh, with us. And uh, just to give you a bit of context, it was during the time of the, what we call the Toronto blessing, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit there in Toronto or whatever. And many people from all over the world would want to go to Toronto to experience, to be slain in the spirit and visions and rolling and manifestation. They, 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 it was very strong all over the world it was at that time. And this lady was, uh, we were having conversation because we had spent a lot of hours together. And she was telling me why she went to Toronto and why it was so important for her to do. She was at a point in her life where she was doubting God. And by going to Toronto and being slain in the spirit, she would receive uh, some sorts of a proof that God exists for her and that she was okay with God. I said that, that was kind of the approach for that. And I, I, I I was a bit asking questions about her faith and things like that. But anyway, that was her experience. I'm not, I'm not judging her, not saying right, wrong, or whatever it is. I, I'm just questioning this, this approach. But people want a glimpse of God's glory for different reasons according to their own uh, experience and their own walk with God. To Moses, it was to gain a deeper sense of God's nature. God, let me see your glory. You, you chose me to, to lead you, you people. But I, I need to know you more. And, and God, you know, the, f the, the best thing is that God granted his answer. He, he, and that's amazing because he asked and God says, okay, I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. And then uh, the next slide, we have the answer of God. God said, 
I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you. So here God talks about his holiness. He talks about himself, about the, his character, his own nature, my goodness. That's how God speaks of himself. I will uh, call my goodness to pass before you. I will proclaim the, nor the name of the Lord, Jehovah, I am. I will proclaim I am. That is who I am. And then he declares his, his real nature. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show compassion on whom I'll show compassion. So God, Mo I don't know if Moses was expecting this kind of answer. Moses says, show me your glory. Like, to me, show me, Moses. let me see something of you. But God is, is saying something else here. It's not only showing you something. It's revealing to you who I am. You must understand, not only see a light, that's, that's, that could lead you to idolatry. You must know that who this light is, the person, the, the character, the, the uniqueness, the holiness of, the, of me. I am. I am who I am. And I am the one who will decide in my power, my authority, my sovereignty to show gracious grace, forgiveness to who I want to. I am the one. I will let you see my, my goodness. Not let you see my, in a way my beauty. He says, I will let you see my character and actions. And that's what he saw. And I think this is the key to understanding God's glory. When God chose to reveal his glory to you and to me, we must understand more of his nature. And then by doing that, it will change our relationship to him. And we will be led to honor him more. To have this desire, this motivation, you know, and to live into a higher level of living. And this is a better, to me, definition of sanctification. It's not negative sanctification. Sanctification is not to only separate yourself from sin. It is to live higher of God, closer to God, more like God, to understand God in a deeper level, to, to raise and to living in a higher glory for God. And when I read this text, I see something else. And last night I was asking myself the question, would it be uh, a text that would help me to help us to understand when God will judge the great white throne judgment. When God will judge all human beings who will stand before the great white throne, books will be opened, and those whose name are not written in the book of life will be thrown and what? And fire, like a fire. If you look at this text here, it says, you cannot see my face because a man cannot see me and live. And I'm thinking of the um, Isaiah standing there, woe to me, I'm a sinner. And you see all the, the, the fire, the, the beauty, the holiness of God. And he's afraid. This is, this is something very special that, we, that, you, that you read here about. Uh, you know, the, the experience of Isaiah was not like, yeah, yeah, glory, glory. It was not that kind of thing. It was not a concert of Christian music. It was not a party atmosphere. It was a very dramatic uh, experience. His response to God was, woe to me, I'm dying, I'm going to die. I, I, I'm, I'm too impure, God is too pure, I, I cannot, who, who am I? So it's not like a party or that. It's not like a superficial, as so many times of praise and worship that we, we, we have uh, experience. So here to his experience, when he saw his holiness, it made him realize his sinfulness. It led him to true repentance. And I was um, listening to G.I. Packer, great theologian, an uh, older man, and he's talking about the importance in our modern Christianity to rediscover biblical repentance. If we would see more of God's glory high and lifted up and his, and his holiness, we would feel the need for more biblical repentance in our life. Don't you think so? I know that you, you don't agree with me, many of you, because you didn't say amen. But anyway, hallelujah. But then this true repentance led him to uh, forgiveness. He was forgiven. 
And the good thing again, and it is a, again a good side and a good result of sanctification, he was called to serve. That's when he was called, not before. Isaiah was not called before this experience. He was called after this experience. He was called after seeing the glimpse of God's glory. He was called after he realized his sinfulness. He was called after he repented. And God forgave him. And God says, who's going to go with, uh, with me? Lord, send me. B before he could not have said, send me. He said, no, I can't. I can't. I'm too sinful. I can't do that. But then after that, he was able to do. So that's the key to understand God. And sometimes, and, and Moses also, it could be also a, a sign of um, uh, seeking the approval of God, to, to have the assurance of God. I, I remember in my, own, in my own experience, just before, 29 years ago, when I was considering to move my family to Asia, sell our house, give everything, and then move here with the four children, I really ask God to show me his glory. Lord, let me see something. Let me see something that, you, that shows me that you approve. And I think that in the question that Moses is asking God, Lord, show me your glory. Because God has asked Moses to lead his people in the wilderness. He says, you will go and lead me, but me, I'm not going because you are sinful people. And Moses says, if you are not coming with us, don't send us alone but without you I don't want to go so God if you if you really I, I, I find favor in your eyes Lord if you really are sending me if I'm okay if we if we're okay together show me your glory let me see your approval and then and that in that sense so this is this is really important so, number three the glory of God and Jesus this is awesome the next slide John chapter 1 verse 14 the word became flesh and live among us. We gaze on his glory, the kind of glory. And, and look at this text again, the kind of glory. There are many kinds of glories, but there's a unique kind here of glory. We gaze on his glory, the kind of glory that belongs to the Father's unique Son. This kind of glory is full of grace and truth. There's a fullness there, and that fullness overflow over whoever comes to him. Of his fullness, we all have received grace upon grace. You know that Jesus is the visible manifestation of God's nature. Think about our definition. Holiness is who God is, his perfection, his character, his intention. But how do you know that without seeing a manifestation? If I say, for example, my wife is a very kind person, this is our descriptions of her character. And how do you know that she is kind or gentle? You just sit with her, talk with her, or spend time with her, and then you will realize, you will see a manifestation of her character. You will understand more who she is. That is what happened with Jesus. How, how could a finite mind comprehend an infinite God? A perfect perfection. How can imperfection comprehend or display perfection? So in Jesus, we have the visible manifestations of God's holiness and human form. So that you can understand God's intentions, God's nature. He allows us to, to comprehend who he is. We saw his glory full of grace. We see him. And when we see him, his glory... It brings over an overflow of grace upon grace. You need more grace, there's more grace. There's never, it says in the Bible, that the, 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 the rivers of God never tarries. There, there's no, no such a thing as a, a tarrying. Oh, you've got enough. As long as you will want to have more of God's glory, living for God's glory, there will be an overflow of more grace upon grace, more grace. And that's good for business people. That's good for anybody of us who lives under pressure day in, day out, that are going through a crisis and the difficulties. Because grace over grace, the overflow of God will be there. This is also sanctification and power to live. You know, sanctification is such a positive con con concept. Because it connects you with God, it takes what belongs to God and brings it in power and transforming our lives. Next slide, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We see in the words of Paul here. 
And we all, with unveiled face, reflecting the glory of the Lord as in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, which is from the Lord who is the Spirit. You know, when you go in the MTR many times, you see many of the ladies, they are with their mobile phone like this. I was always wondering, what are they doing? Why did they, their phone they cannot see? And then I realized, oh, they are looking at themselves and they are putting on the makeup and the lipsticks. They are looking at an image and, and, the, and, the, and the mirror, and, uh, you know, you wonder about this. And this is a bit of what we see here. And if you have ever taken some selfies, with you, me, I hate to take selfies of my face like this, <laughs> because there's always a part that is too big, or they deform or transform all this. And that's a little bit what is happening with us and the reflections of God. Because God is perfect, and then through the mirror, you are imperfect. There's a, a, a transform. So there's a, a transform. Degree. So we are being transformed in the same image, but from one degree and to another degree. And that is the beauty of our sanctification. The more you see Christ, the more <laughs> you see a better I, I image. It's a bit dim. It's imperfect. Maybe not the right shape, but it's coming. It's coming along and it's getting better. You know, sometimes it is too close. Just put it a bit further. Oh, it's better, you know. And then the more you will walk with Jesus, the better the image will, will be. Okay, next slide. Living for the glory of God. We have a series of scriptures here that tells us and reminds us that we are meant to live for the glory of God. You and I are fruits. Uh, uh, here, let your light shine so that people will glorify God. And First Thessalonians, I like it so much that we are uh, exhorted to live in a way worthy of God who calls you and to His glory. That, 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 and His kingdom and in His glory to be part of what He's doing in His kingdom, to be a reflection of who He is, to make seen. Remember when you hear the word glory, it is His character being seen being displayed by actions. When you love someone in his name, they can see. That's why I was referring to the evacuation center in the Philippines. Because truly, if you, I think you can agree with that, there's an evacuation center. Is there a more depressing place than this? They don't know when they are going to go out. How, how many would you like to be in an evacuation center when you have one toilet for hundreds of uh, people there? And just wait to receive some food and some kind of help. How depressive can it be? And then you see these people coming with smile and songs and, and games for the children and food and, and all sorts of the Bible studies, declaring who God is, seeing who we are, we are Christians, we are coming here in the love of Jesus. That's wonderful. That is a display of God's character and glory to people who really, really need it. And they are bringing hope. They are bringing joy. They are bringing love. They are the, a, a mirror of the image of God. They are bringing this. And I say amen to that because they are great. These people are great people. To glorify God is to be used to reflect God's character. We can all do that. And we are all called to do this. We are called to live in His glory. So that when there is love, when there is power, when you pray for someone, God's people appreciate God. And God is being honored by your way of life. Amen. Another truth about God's glory and us living in the glory of God. Perfection cannot be shown through imperfection. I am imperfect. I cannot really display the perfection of God. But when God glorifies, is glorified through me, it is God who glorifies himself, not me. I cannot really do it on my own. When you glorify God, it is God glorifying himself through you. To glorify God is to make people aware of God. Make him aware of his awesome uh, nature and, and power. And the last point, we're finishing with that, the future glory of God. That's, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. Romans 8, 17, 2 Thessalonians, Romans 5. Look at these series of scriptures. And order that we may also share in His glory or obtain His glory. Many translators use obtain His glory instead to make it clear. So that you can obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So 
we, we are called to end the glory of God, to live for the glory of God, to live by the glory of God, to display God's glory, but we have this hope and this joy inside of us to tell us, this is my future, this is where I'm going, and this is a strength, this is a, the, what motivates my, my life. Go on with Jesus, stay close to Jesus, love Jesus more and more. Th this coming, this is coming. The glory of God, we will, we will see that. That you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Apostle Paul, it is the ultimate stage of salvation. This is why you are saved. God is restoring his image progressively and you. First of all, he forgives your sin and just justification. But through sanctification, discovering his glory, living for his glory, we are being transformed and transformed and transformed. You know what? I often question the scriptures, Philippians chapter 1, 6, that we often quote. God who began a good work and you is faithful, he will complete it or make it perfect. I'm always wondering, when I look at myself, how is he going to do that? Because I'm so imperfect. How is he going to complete his work? But that's what he is doing as much as his glory becomes uh, active into my life. God has done everything with one great end in view of a great end. You and I, we are to live to the praise of his glory. That's why I exist. That's why you exist. We need to do that. We need to get back that high and lifted up vision of God. Now, you see sometimes in winter in Hong Kong, you look by the window, or if you take a shower, the humidity inside, the cold outside, the glass becomes, you know, uh, dim. You cannot see. It's like full of uh, humidity in the glass. You cannot see. But you can see something, but you cannot see really, really perfect. Okay? That's, that's exactly how we look at, the, at the, this glory of God to come. We, we see it like through a glass. It's a bit dim. We, are, we don't see it perfectly. But there's a day coming where the glory of God, you will be right there. It will not be through a glass. It will be, it will be the reality. The glory of God is no, no, no need for the sun because the glory of God will be the light that by which we will live. We will be with him. We will not be waiting for him anymore. We are waiting for, but not anymore at that time. Say amen to that. Amen. When the glory of God comes into our broken lives, to see more of his glory makes us more sanctified. Amen? And that's the beauty and the positive side. And I want to leave you with, with something I was reading this week, and I think this is the awesome scriptures of, of hope and positive to us. The next, the last slide, this one, John chapter 17, verse 22. If you read John chapter 17, I want you to observe and count how many times the word glory comes written in this text. You will be surprised. I never realized it until this week. The word glory is mentioned all over this text. Verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to Amen. who is them? Us. Us. I'm, it's me and you together. The glory that God the Father has given in Jesus, I have given to who? To me. To me. Hallelujah. And when does that take place? Is that for the future? No, it is for the now, isn't it? That's great. I, I, I'm happy to know that. That he has given his glory to me right now so that I can display his glory, live by his glory, discover his glory, sing and praise his glory. But look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. When is it? Future or present? Future. Future. That they will see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. I think that's awesome. Amen. Amen? Amen. You have received the glory now to live full for Christ. And you have the assurance. And that is the desire of God. The prayer of Jesus Christ. It is his intercession for you and for me. That we will be with him and we will see his glory. Wow! His, his wow glory. Can you say that? Wow glory? Wow glory. 
Yes, it is his wall glory, not this little glimpse of glory, not this dim glory, not the window glory, the mirror glory, the full wall glory of God, as we have described in this text. It is the desire of Jesus. This is, he prayed that for you and for me. And that is what's coming for us.